So we really wanted to to share our knowledge and and it's really like exciting part. So I think first of all, what I wanted to say is it's amazing how we need an interdisciplinary team. So if you think about what we are learning in this workshop, where we have machine learning and artificial intelligence, and then you predict whether your compound is going to be good enough, and then you're going to put it in the assay. And I think it is important to, to understand all of the assays. So I'm not going to talk about in vitro activity assays, not to touch base now on um, in vitro acne assays. <laughs> it's important to understand and it's important to understand how it works. And as soon as we get to PK and as soon as we go to the in vivo part of things, it's amazing how everything gets put together and, and the proof is in the pudding. Okay. I want to start off with um, why do we do PK studies and, and what's the importance of, the importance of getting the right nurse? So it's, um, what Asalia said that all things are poison and nothing is about poison, only the dose, the mix, some things are not poisonous. And I think this is very important and I think this is where I also want to start a presentation on. Why do we study PK? So, we administer a certain dose, kids receive a certain effect or response. Doesn't matter where in which disease area you're working, whether that is kidney or whether that is malaria or any infectious disease. And linking the dose and the response is really like a chain of reactions. And we can predict that this chain of reactions and what they think is going to happen. But as soon as you go to an in vivo situation, you can get a few surprises along the way. And it's great because that's actually the area where you build the puzzle. And for some series that you might be working in or whatever, you can see that for this specific series, we really have this problem. So then you can always go back to your modeling and you know make your model even better to include maybe like other factors like platform protein binding or whatever the case may be, you know, something that you need to take into consideration. So it is always an evolving loop. Um, so just defining PK and PD. So pharmacokinetics can be simply defined as um, what the body, what your body does to the drug. And then pharmacodynamics is actually the opposite of that. <coughs> Okay, so what the drug will do to the body if you have a certain disease. Okay. So you guys can give me on the microphone if you need to go with Okay, so from a mechanics, it's not time for my phone, thank you gave such beautiful introduction to acne. So in an in vivo situation, you actually have a very similar um, effect going on in the body where we have a liberation step, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. This is now a very dynamic system where everything needs to come into place <coughs> to, to get the desired effect that you're looking for. All right, so. Today, I really want to focus, so I know, and, and even as I stand before you guys today, and being a DMPK scientist, I, I don't think it was stop learning. I think it's a bigger learning process, and I think especially today you guys might feel like this is a lot. And um, I don't know where, and parents and baby, and how does all of this fit together. So I actually want to keep it quite simple, as simple as possible today. So I'm really going to focus on these primary PK parameters, um, because these reflect the actual physiological processes that involve. And then to your right hand side, we have the secondary PK parameters. And, and these are just features um, of the PK curve that you get. But the most important PK parameters is actually your bioavailability and then your clearance and your volume of distribution. And so, absorption, I'm not going to focus too much on this because Matthew actually went through quite a bit of detail with um, the in vitro acne section for, for this. So, um, like me, Matthew also mentioned, um, that absorption is the movement of an unchanged drug from your site administration 
um, into the circulation, into the blood. And it is determined by um, the, the physiochemical properties of the drug, is determined by the formulation of the drug, and then also the routes of administration, and there's various routes of administration for various diseases. Um, you can think about, even in malaria, there's two, there's IV administration and there's oral administration, and um, well, inhalation and well, a lot now. You know, um, they are people with COVID-19, they actually really want inhalation administration of, of contact. Okay, so very, very important, and Matthew also touched base on this, your drug must be in solution to be absorbed. So if we think about barriers to absorption, so this is, is quite something, and I think if I can share quick fixes with you guys today, this is something that differs a little species. How your cytochrome P450 enzymes are expressed, and um, in the human, for example, <coughs> 3A4 is, is mainly expressed in the liver. But for example, in a primate, this is actually a, a, a cytochrome P450 that is more abundantly expressed in the intestine. So often, when you do some of the scientific studies, you will need to do it in rodents, and then you move to higher species. Often, they include like a monkey species, and then they see all of a sudden a signal bioavailability for the living. And, um, this is often the cause. It's just because that enzyme is more abundantly expressed in the intestine. Okay, so now we're taking the drug. It's following the pill. It is going into the stomach. There is already, um, you know, the solution plays a role in how how this compound can go into solution, and then it goes into your small intestine. In your small intestine, that is where it's first barrier is for absorption because actually in your small intestine you also have the cytokine P450s. There can be metabolism, there can be efflux um, transporters, CGP must be touched on that. And already some of your drugs might be metabolized and only 30% will end up in circulation. So now this 30% is going to enter the liver next, where you also have your your cytokine people flip seats if you further metabolized, you also might have some efflux transports to CGPs, um, for which it might be a substrate, and, and that can also influence your your bioavailability at the end of the day. So I think whenever you guys think and, and as you move through the project, whether you are a chemist, whether you're a biologist, it really doesn't matter. But I think this is really a demonstration, not only of barriers to absorption, but how important the clearance is of your molecule and how that will really have a great effect on your bioavailability at the end of the day. Next. Right, so what is bioavailability? So bioavailability represents a fraction of intact, intact drug that is essentially available um, to reach you know, that will be your, <coughs> your circulation. So just to put this into a picture and, and also to prep us to the next slide, just as an example, if we decide, okay, now we've done with the machine learning, we think we have our compound, they've actually confirmed activity in your in vitro assays, acidic, parasites, or bacteria, or whatever it might be. You guys have predicted the, the acne properties of this compound, and it's also really looking good. It's looking good in the in vitro acid assays. Now you're, you're thinking about doing an in vivo PT study. And um, so guys will come in the room, you will have a chat to the DMP team, and they will tell you that you need both an oral and an IVA. Or the IVA is definitely the reason for this is you actually put in that compound, making sure that it is in solution for your dose. And you're actually putting it into circulation. So what's happening there is 100% is available in circulation. Now you have a second step. Whether that is IP intraperitoneal administration or oral administration, it doesn't really matter. But that administration is going to go through the whole process of 
experience symptoms of the community ages and the stomach moving into the least months with very different pain levels. That the system has to be permeable, it's going to be maybe by unstable or maybe by stable, but it's really going to go through this whole process. And at the end of the day, you're actually going to get um, an area under the curve for, for that administration. So, in this example, this is an IV administration area under the curve and then an oral administration because you know in your IV your compound fundraising are available. So now I'm going to get the area under the curve that you get from your oral administration to that of your IV, and you're going to be able to determine by the availability of your compound. Right, so normally the area under the curves, um, it is determined by trapezoidal rule. This is going to be with the non compartmental places, most other ones as well. And why is bioavailability important? It is important because it can play a role in determining um, the dose that you need for your clinical study. So um, this is really the part where the volume puzzle starts, where you know what your activity is in vitro, maybe you have concerned activity in vivo as well in the disease model, you know what your peak is in, life in various species. And now you're going to do this a matrix scaling to see what will be needed in the case. So this is why this is important. Okay, so yeah. Um, just curious. If for 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 blood drugs, what do you do about So with per drug, so you you can do you mean you have a compound that is not and it will be metabolized to that. Yes. So you will need your both during your your, your um PK, and I think you will need a bit more intense modeling for that because you won't be administrating the program but oh the like the active you will actually be administrating the program. So I think you will also have to administer the active and just compare with their administering it. Maybe the program is more soluble. Is your amount of active that's being formed from the single pro drug and then you see just the active alone that is not because you will need that in much more complicated modeling. All right, so volume of distribution. This is something that and I thought they say often these very good publications like by Dana Smith. He's one of our consultations, consultants for a lot of our projects, and we have had great learning from him um, on volume of distribution and clearance, especially. So, um, all of those publications are available, and, and until this day, I still go and read the publication on volume of distribution because it is something that is so apparent that it's not easy to understand volume of distribution. Oh, Matthew, he was just the last one he's going to ask. Thanks, Ronald. All right, so um, it's important. So, volume of distribution is um, a proportionality factor that, that relates to, if we look at this equation, it is um, comparing the total amount of drug in the body to whatever is measured in circulation. So volume of distribution is apparent just because it is an assumption that is made. The assumption that they make is that the assumption that they make is that you will take a certain medication and it will be absorbed into your circulation. And it will reach a steady state in circulation, and at that steady state concentration, it is that the concentration in the entire body is the same as that in circulation. So it's equilibrium being reached. Okay, so how do you interpret 
on your distribution. So, um, in humans, if it is less than four liters, it is confined to plasma. Between four and 14 liters, it is distributed to our plasma and all black cells. And then greater than 42 liters, it is settled in the tissues. So this is quite an important thing, especially like Matthew also mentioned, when you think about the different disease areas. Malaria is in the blood. So you would want your compound to be in the blood. TB yeah. is sitting in your lungs. So you want your compound to actually reach that brain nervous and to be able to penetrate and to, to kill the bacteria. Okay. Right. So the volume of distribution actually provides very little um, information about the specific patterns of distribution. And it can be distributed to the fatty tissues, to extracellular fluid, and to specific tissues. There in the blue block boxes are just, again, a few quick fixes that we share with you guys. It is, um, it's nice to learn these lessons early on. Um, the trans and volume of distribution, but there is a small low or high volume of distribution. All right, so why is volume of distribution important? It is important because as soon as you do that oral administration, your compound is going to be absorbed in circulation. And at some point, that equilibrium between your body and your circulation is going to reach a steady state of concentration. And for your compound to be active against the disease area like you're working in, you actually want to know what the burden dose will need to be. So often for a lot of medications on the first day, you will need to take 600 milligrams, for example, and on day, day two and three, you will only take 300. The reason for that 600 is you want to reach that steady state. Okay, so with us being in a modeling course this week. This is also something that's normally modeled. You know what will be needed and what we need for the learning course and how we do this. Yes. Right. Unbound concentrations. So I cannot emphasize how important this is in just discovering the business. It is um listeners that that myself and Matthew and I think the entire BMPK team um we can only learn a little bit later on. Uh, we were quite new when we went into this, and, and so I'm happy to share this with you guys early on. So, yes, definitely good important. All right, so only unbound drug diffuses into the tissues and have the effect that you needed to have. So, again, I've listed a few fixes for you guys. This is all on the slides, and you have it available. So, whenever you well, with PK, you know, you can always go back and just check, okay, my drug is acidic, so it's most likely going to be picked to one, um, to all that, and so forth. So your fraction unbound um, depends heavily on your affinity for proteins, and then your protein concentration, and then, of course, the concentration of the drug. Clearance. So Matthew also touched on this. Clearance is actually the metabolism and excretion part of, of the, the in vivo at vivo file. So that is how your drug is metabolized in the liver and then how it is, like Matthew also mentioned, um, metabolized in the liver and normally the aluminum is excreted. Um, so Clearance is very important, and I think in the workshop we're going to, I think this is going to become more apparent to you guys of giving the importance of something because often you see a clearance value and then you think, of what does this mean? You know, how do I interpret this case of number and, and I don't understand it? So the way to interpret clearance data is, in your clearance data, is to look at the total hepatic load of the animal. So normally all of the human, and normally this is divided into thirds. So for example, mouse here, the total hepatic blood flow or hepatic blood flow for horse and mice is 90. So then 0 to 30 will be classified as low, 
31 to 60 will be classified as moderate, and then 61 to 90 will be classified as high parents. Okay, this is based on table two. If we can have a closer look in the skills or a chart at entrance if they can be our unbound parents. And that is actually the important elements that you want to optimize when you work with various drugs. Because often it can seem that you might be in a low parents range, but as soon as you go and correct that, if that's improved in my age, you will actually find that your parents is much higher. Okay. So this is now a really fun class. Daniel PK work, you have done um you've done your in vitro work. And, and you think your pre plan your bioavailability is, is good enough to see whether you will have them fit. So often, I think when you do an in vitro study, it's important to remember that, that, that it is not a, a dynamic situation. It is, you really have 96 well plates, and you put parasites in there a certain amount, and you put drug concentration in there a certain amount, and you make dilutions go up. And that's all that's present. So anything that can influence that activity that you see in vitro is maybe unspecific binding um, in the assay. But then as soon as you go into the in vivo situation, picture change quite a bit. So we can see here everything that is involved. So you will have an inherent dose, but then absorption plays a role, clearance plays a role, the volume of distribution. Bioavailability, binding to protein. You just name it, everything. Permeability comes in, into play. So um, at the end of the day, here, the right hand side, we have got total parasites. Then this is based on malaria. And um, this is over days of treatment, maybe in an FPC model. And um, you can see that the parasitemia is decreasing. Um, and then there's some recrudescence, it seems. Now, if you put all of this together, you will also take some blood samples here in an MPC study, and you will actually measure the drug concentrations because the PK within an in vivo um, efficacy model can be different to that in healthy animals. Okay, so it's also now you have the disease that can be different. And to see whether your drug is effective, and hopefully this will be good news, that as the concentration of drug changes, you um, see it it's on your pharmacy by number two, whether that is parasites in the bacteria. But I think this is, you know, all the excitement stuff, and then it will grow into to the more advanced in the OPK studies where you will have look at toxicology and, and make sure that is clean and ending phase one human trials. So I think um, that is the only part that I'm going to share with you guys today. You know, if there is any pressing questions, I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot to understand. So I'm not describing it. I'm really I'm getting relationship in trouble. <laughs> Since we we say this each drug is connected, distributed like some or the fit, so how do we make sure that our drug is distributed more than that center? So you will have to see whether if you do a PD study, whether you need to do an efficacy study in the initial model, I think proof of proving is that you will see activity. But there is also, and that you can help me on this, there's also um, models that can predict how your drug will be distributed in the initial compartment. Is it going into the drug that you can use on its kidneys service? There is other ways to, to, to get more information on that. With the use of models, we will be sharing some some software that 
big news with the mining of big stands and things, then I think we can put it into the way that you see actually to take it back to back to the and you will need that in order to take the drug treatment. Yes, so we can, can I ask them again? You need it. Okay, so Samik is asking me the million dollar question. And his question is in in the anti malaria field, um, they are really pushing for a single day cure. The ones who come out that with one day she will have cured. And um, he's asking how that model will look like and, and do I think it's achievable. So I have got, and this is completely my own opinion. So I think it's also something important to remember that the population affected by malaria is mostly children and pregnant women. So my opinion of that is the single dose is quite a high bar for cure because often you know that will be a higher dose that you will need to get because it's a single dose. And often with a higher dose, you run into trouble with that. You know, that you will also be off target. You will have off this target activity as well. Um, at the end of the day, um, for me, I think it is actually better a low dose in treatment. Just for safety reasons, I think, especially in children, it's pretty good. So you will always have an argument. So he's asking how do we decide which dose, whether it needs to be uh, oral dose or intraperitoneal or IV. So I think in a big case study, you will often have, you will always have an IV dose because you may you need that one day where you have to come from 100% bioavailability. You know, you need that bioavailability. But then another factor to take into consideration is the disease area. What is the limitation to that? And, and what is the space that you can move within that disease area? So we have often had, for example, cancer compounds, often you see their drug bioavailability with intraperitoneal administration compared to oral administration. So um, because then you've got lots of things in the cover and you're protected. So I think for any disease area, and you also have to think about when you take this compound to the market. What is the cost and the involved in the administration route? Do we have the patient population receiving this for the oral drug? You know, it's easier to get a oral, you know, topical liquid stream than having to go to IV or get some foreign ones to the market. But you will fix it, you will see the you know, if you have big mortality issues, then often you want to be considered an IV. Very good question. So she's asking about combination therapy, and I think often in infectious disease area, you sit with the problem of resistance, right? So um, it is not often that you give a monotherapy. Mostly drugs are like they give a combination therapy kind of also to protect the one with the other one and then use the most of action of like that kind of ability for a minute. And it is exactly as you say. Often, if you think about the anti-malarial field, you will have an arsenic, which is extremely active. 
is nine stars and half stars is very short. And you will combine that with something that has longer half stars and long half stars. And it just gets very convenient. Very size because often means you don't get the look in the night infection of the new antiviral drug at a certain stage of the Is, um, I think they will always be antimicrobial resistances. Absolutely, especially with the drugs, they just always get smaller. I mean, I think they also use um, pathogen chamber resistance. Thank you. 